Good morning to you all. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of coming before you this morning. It is a great, great privilege. And without your Son, no man can approach you. But with Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us and our forgiveness, we're allowed to come into your presence. Lord, thank you for his, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, which is all ours now and the life that we have in Him. Father, I pray for Your Word to be honored and the, is, is an extension of Your life and breath and an extension of the life of the Son of God. Lord, thank You for uh, the opportunity to come and read Your Scriptures, to do them, Lord, and to experience You, to honor You and glorify You and enjoy You forever. Glorify Your Son now. In His name we pray. Amen. I'll tell you the story of Samuel. Samuel, when he was a boy, his mother, who could not have a child, had prayed for him. Had prayed for him. Okay? And so when she had a child, she said, if, if I get a young boy, that boy will belong to the Lord. And so she was given a child. Okay? And by the way, there are seven miraculous births in the Bible. She's one of them. So anyway, she gets this child. And she refuses to go up to the temple until that child is old enough to be weaned. She takes him and she takes that little boy and she takes him and dedicates him to the temple to and the high priest and the responsibilities there. And guess where he slept? You know where his bedroom was? <coughs> the tabernacle. The little boy is sleeping in that tabernacle. He's, sleeping, he's in a tent, right? He's like a constant um, camp out. But his mom had made him a little priest outfit. So he's running around there. And it reminds me of the little boys when they dress like cowboys. They've got their hats and their boots and their, right, and their guns or... Or they got an arrow in their bows and arrows and, and feathers in their hair and things like that. So she, he's running around. That little boy's running around. He looks like the priest. Okay, he's he's wearing the ephod. He's doing those type of things. Now this is where it gets interesting. It says that God spoke to him while he was there, and he got up and he didn't know. It, it says he didn't know the Lord. And if you're raised in a Christian home, it doesn't mean you know the Lord. It doesn't mean that at all. Okay. So what happens is he runs to Eli because he thought Eli was talking to him. Okay? And one of the signs that you don't know the Lord is you can't tell, tell the difference between God speaking and me speaking. Or anybody else up here. Okay? If God is speaking to your, your heart and you confuse that with the words of men. And this happens a couple of times. And finally Eli, who's so old and so hard-hearted, he doesn't even hear the Lord's voice anymore. But he remembers his past and he tells him, next time you hear that voice, don't run to me. He says, just say, Lord, I'm listening. Talk to me. And he had a conversation with the Almighty. He, he kind of met the Lord it's out by himself, right? You have to call on the, on the Lord. Your parents can't do it for you. Nobody can do it for you. I can't do it for you. When you're a young boy or young girl, the time is going to come when you need to go before God and, and tell Him about your sins and your wrongdoings and re realize that, Lord, I'm in a lot of trouble without you, without Jesus dying for me and, and paying that blood price for, and uh, His death paying for me. Okay? And God began to communicate through Him and it was Samuel who raised that whole nation up because he was given by his mom to the, to the Lord. And he was the one who, he went from north to south and he created the schools of the prophets and all of a sudden people were getting educated about the, uh, you know, it's like a school of business. You study business, school of the prophets. They studied the prophets. And he began to raise that whole thing up. Okay? Later on, the whole thing collapsed and the prophets of Baal came to power and on the days of Elijah and Elisha, they opened the schools back up. Okay, because a good education in, in the Word of God is, it changes a nation. But every one of you, you kids, you, you, you need to make peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ and His cross and nobody can do that for you. You must learn to recognize His voice. Okay? Alright, James chapter 5. The book of James... He starts off, he says, this is for the Jews who are scattered everywhere. Remember early on, there were no Gentiles in the church. That's not until chapter like 10 and 11. First Gentiles came into the church. And Peter went back and they said, how dare you go to the Gentiles? Right? And so it was, and Jesus actually commented with the Sidonian woman. He says, I'm not going to give the, the dinner of the children to, to, the, to the dogs because she had postured herself as a dog. And that won't get you anything. And he says, but the day will come. Just wait. 
the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles, okay, but not yet. But it finally did. Until then, Jesus was very clear, don't not go to the Gentiles yet. Go here first. Okay? Do this, right? So for years, there were no Gentiles in the church. It was all Jewish. And so when we get to the book of James, and this is why some people think it may be the first book written, he's talking to believers who are in the synagogues. Okay? And later on, the believers who are Jewish, who are in the synagogue, he calls them the church. Right Now, if you read through the book of Acts, when the church went and prepared the gospel, Paul went into a synagogue regularly. He would open up the scriptures and insert Jesus and do that. And then people would promptly get ran out of the synagogue. Okay? So the churches did not inhabit the synagogues. They, they ended up having to be independent. But in the latter days, there's going to come a time, and in chapter 5, he's going to describe those latter days when, when the Jews are coming to Christ, but not all. Okay? Many of them are coming to Christ, but for various and sundry reasons. And he's going to talk about those rich Jewish people who are in there who are abusing their Jewish brothers. Okay? And he also comments in the fifth chapter that it's a time when Jesus is at the door, like a judge, when he puts on his robes and he stands at the door and he waits to be announced. And Jesus is at the door. He's almost here. And he's going to tell them how to deal, deal with that. All right? So chapter 5. You come now, you who, who, are, who are rich... If you're not rich, don't worry about this. Okay? By the way, these are not just the rich. They are pampered and they are treated differently than the poor are in the churches. And he tells them that's an evil thing to do. You shouldn't be, nobody should be doing that. All right? So there's no difference between a rich man and you. He's a man just like everybody else. He's, a, he's in the image of God like everybody else. And he's not to be given preference. All right? By the way, the poor are not to be given preference either. Okay. You guys weep and howl for all your wretchedness of those that are coming upon you. The riches which are yours, they have rotted. Can you imagine having so much, so much gold and silver and rubies and diamonds and all that kind of thing? The stuff's just rotting. I mean, it's incredible. And your garments, they've become moth-eaten. I was having breakfast this morning. And something flew and hit me in the back of the head. Uh, and there's this great big moth. I <laughs> told my wife, there's a moth in this. I haven't seen a moth in years in my house. Years. And all of a sudden, I got dinged right in the back of the head because he's psychotic. Uh, <laughs> it was a kamikaze thing. And then he landed. My wife took a towel and tried to swat at him. And all that did was just kind of blow him away. So he's running around our house somewhere. <laughs> it's mothy, right? Garments that are just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. <clears throat> the gold that is yours and the silver has rusted itself down. And the rusty poison of them is going to be towards a witness to you guys. And it's going to eat your flesh that is yours as fire. <clears throat> you guys have treasured up in these last days. Now you know what happens with rust. You have to be careful. You get tetanus shots and things like that so it doesn't poison your, your system and kill you. Now, he's describing gold that's going to kill you. And he's using those examples that, the, that you've lost your mind. What are you doing? What are you doing? Look, the wage of the workers. Those who collected the harvest of the fields belonging to you guys, <clears throat> that one has been set aside by fraud. Now, you notice where they're getting their wealth. They're defrauding people that they owe, King. Okay? By you guys, he's crying. And the screaming of those who are doing the harvest with the summer heat, those who are paying the price, they've entered into the ears of the boss who is lord of hosts of the armies. Now, that's a little ominous phrase about the lord who may come when he might come with armies. Okay. Let me tell you about armies. When they came in, like the Romans, when the Romans came in, they selected the rich people and they tormented them and, and tortured them and killed them until they told them where their gold and silver was. Okay. And in those days, when everybody got up and everybody had to go to work, right, and walk out to the, where the fields were and things like that, if you were a big man and uh, you didn't have to work, so they just rounded up all the big people and tortured them. <laughs> I know you're rich. Look at the size. You don't work. Right? They would do that kind of thing. And where's your gold and where's your, where's your silver? That's how they did it. And so the idea of the armies here is a special place in hell for those who are going to play this game. Verse 5. 
You guys have indulged in luxurious pleasure upon this earth. You guys have indulged in sensual pleasures. You guys have fattened the hearts that are yours in a day of butchering. Everybody knows what it is. Maybe we don't in our day, but, but um, my grandfather used to have a ranch, and he would take a pig or a cow, and he would fatten that thing up. You get in there and he gets all, eat all that he wants to eat until he's just huge, right? And he, why, why is he making him huge? For the dinner table. That's all that thing is. I'm sure the animal's thinking, well, God must love me. Look. Man, somebody's going to love you on the dinner table. Now notice this is what this fat guy is doing. He's, he's fat in gold and silver and, and all this other stuff. And he's defrauding other people. And this is not the right thing to do. You guys are condemned by prosecution. You have murdered the just person. And he's not lined up against you guys. There's no movement against you. Kind of thing. Now, he's going to change here. Now, those of you who are suffering. Verse 7. <coughs> now, he's going to link this to the latter days. And it'll, it'll be bad in the latter days. Okay? And he's not going to solve all our problems. Okay? You guys take on long passions. Passions carry the idea of, and I notice this is going to hurt, and it's going to hurt for a long time. Okay? Long suffering. What does long suffering mean? Does it mean, it mean, boy, I had to stand in line for 45 minutes. I really have suffered long. No, it means this can go on for years. Long passions, therefore, brother, until the presence of the boss Lord is here. Look, the farmer expectantly welcomes the valuable fruit of the earth. Be long passioned ones upon this until it is actually received the early and the latter rain. Now, the early and the latter rain, scholars will show you the early harvest when the Jews were coming to Christ. There'll be a latter harvest at the, right at the end. Okay, and it's not here yet. You guys also, you guys be long passioned. You guys sturdy your hearts. Now, notice, fortify yourself, get ready for this because the presence of the boss Lord has come near. Well, when you see the Jews in the end, and you see them coming to Christ, the Lord is near. Jesus is putting on his robes, and he's getting ready to come. Verse 9. Don't you guys grumble with narrowing and sighing that I'm so frustrated because my life is narrowed in. Don't do that. Don't grumble, <coughs> brothers, so that you guys won't be judged. Look. The judge has taken a stand before the doors. If you're seeing these events, you just be careful here. Don't get in trouble right at the end. Verse 10. You guys take for an exhibit. This is the word to put underneath your eye. Exhibit under the eyes, brothers, the bad suffering and the long passions of the prophets who spoke in the name of the boss Lord. Now, the prophets had a rough go. <laughs> you know... There's are weirdos out there today. They want to be prophets and they want to fly jets and, live and drive Rolls Royces and be wealthy men. Well, you should look at the prophets in the Old Testament. Isaiah and Jeremiah, both of them were sawed in half. Okay? Others were beaten, spit upon. Lamentation is an incredible book. Nobody wants to read that book because it's cruel and it's harsh. It's a horrible Things that Jeremiah went through. They knocked him down, took their feet, stomped on his feet. He says they bashed his teeth out in the gravel. That's a prophet. Not the modern silliness of wealthy men. Okay. Look, we esteem them blessed. God bless Jeremiah. Those who remained under the, the remaining under trials. Job the hated, because that's what his name means. Job was hated. You guys have heard of him, okay? And you guys have seen the end of the boss lord, okay? And meant the many affections of the spleen. What a word. The spleen of our boss lord, merciful. You know, this is interesting. It can, spleen, some would translate bowels of compassion, bowels of mercy, and that sort of thing. All right, you've seen how God treated Job, and you've seen how God treated the prophets, Okay? Remember, Moses was almost stoned, fought with Korah's rebellion. Samuel was rejected by the people. The fear of Saul would murder him was, again, part of Samuel's life. David fled from Saul. He fought his, son, uh, his own son, Absalom, and Isaiah and Jeremiah cut in two. Ezekiel hated his calling, was furious with God because he did not want to go. Daniel's lions and, you know, the, the fires 
of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Hosea's prostitute wife, and all the emotional struggle that they, they went through, the burden of Amos, frustration of Habakkuk, etc., etc. But in all of that, there's something inside of God that comes out towards those, those men. It's the only way they could, they could survive. Jeremiah was convinced he was going to be a dead man. Absolutely convinced. Samuel, if, if, Lord, if I go over there, Saul's going to kill me. It'll be the day of my death. And the Lord would intervene and, and communicate with them. And so Jesus looks at us and says, I'm with you until the end of the age. Every one of you, I'll be with every one of you. Verse 12, and before all things, my brothers, <clears throat> don't you guys be swearing the year of the oaths. Don't swear by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let it be for you guys the yes, yes, and the no, no. Okay, just get along in life. Don't be swearing and taking oaths and swearing. Yeah, no, hand to God, I just swear. that. Kind of... In order that you guys do not fall under judgment. And part of that judgment is, like in Ecclesiastes, don't you swear an oath and then don't pay it because God won't think it's funny. He expects it to be paid. If anyone among you is suffering bad passions, well, that's going hard for you, let him pray. Is anyone having good passions? Let him sing a song. Sing, sing some songs. How about that? Okay. Is anyone sickly weak among you guys? Now, some translate the sick is weak. It's the same word for Abraham not being weak in faith. Same word. Right? It doesn't mean sick. It means sickly or weakly. It can be, it can be those things. He's weak among you guys. Let him call for the elders of the called out assembly, the elders of the church as it were. Okay. Let them hold good prayers upon him, those anointing him with oil in the name of the boss who is Lord. Now watch this. And the well-held prayer of the faith, lining up with Scripture, is going to restore the one who is fainting from toil. So he's weak, right? More than sick, he's just frustrated. He's just worn out. And the boss Lord is going to raise him. And whatever sins he may have committed, so we're not talking about sickness, I think we're talking about sin. He's going to be set free. He's calling the elders and says, I can't get over my sin or my temper or, or whatever, whatever's going on here, that he'll be set free from that. Verse 16, you guys confess agreement about your sins. Context is still the same, right? Okay. Therefore, to one another. Okay. By the way, not to everybody. One to another. No one. You got a good friend? Meet with them for coffee and say, "Would you, would you, pray for me? I have a sin problem in my life, and I want it gone. And I, I can't. I'm just. I've been struggling for however long it is. You guys hold good prayers for one another. Now watch this. This is the how. You see that? This is the how. You guys will actually be healed. I'll just go it alone. Well, that's not the how. Okay. And by the way, we confess our sins to one another. It's always embarrassing, isn't it? It's terrible. I've already said, confess your sins, you'll feel better. I've confessed my sins, I feel horrible. It's, it's embarrassing, it's terrible. Okay. This is how, you, if you're going to be healed of whatever sin you may be struggling with, a petition of a righteous man is very much strong being activated. And God sees you here dealing with this. Okay. By the way, he told us in the first chapter, if you're dealing with a double soul, your double lifestyle, he says God won't answer your prayers. Nobody praying for you will do you any good because you've got to repent of, uh, of that. And your own prayers won't work either. Verse 17. By the way, he mentioned Job. Do you remember the story of Job? Job was a rich man. He was a godly man. He was the meekest man on earth at that time. And Satan came before him. He's, God says, if you consider Job, he says, he's serving you for all that you've done for him. You've made him wealthy. You've built a hedge around him and his health and everything. Kind of thing. And so he begins to turn everything over to Satan. He says, but don't kill him. So he goes out and he kills his family. He goes out and he takes his health from him. His servants, he stinks so bad because of the things coming out of him. He's got boils all over him. And he's sitting in the ashes. That his, his servants are afraid to get near him so they would flee from him. Things like that. And his own wife said, curse God and die. And by the way, your breath stinks. Why do you think Satan left her? Get the idea. Anyway. He pleads with God to die. Lord, please take my life. 
I can't handle this. And he, he openly says, I, see, I know that there's no hope for me. And his friends came, <laughs> his friends came, they were the most wicked friends you could actually have. He told them, why are you treating me as my name, as, my, as Job? You're treating me this way. And they had all their, their modern, some, some of their views are, are modern. And, you know, one of the guys, Eliphaz means my God is gold or my strength or my power is in, in my gold. And he says, listen, Job, you've sinned against God. I've had visions and, and dreams and relationship with God. And later on, God said, you liar. You may have had them, but they were your own puffed up fleshly mind. That's where they came from. They come from me. So he, he had these all these kind of things, and he's, and uh, and uh, and a couple of his other friends, and they started falsely accusing Job because they didn't have anything against him, so they made stuff up. And God said they're just lying. And their conclusion with only bad people suffer bad things. Good people don't suffer good bad things. It wasn't true. It wasn't true. And you got Elijah, whose God is Yah. That's what it is, because everybody was worshiping the Baals in that day. He was a man of like suffering passions as us. And in prayer, he prayed that it would be no raining, and it did not rain upon the earth for three years and six months. Now, some believe he's one of those two prophets at the end time, because we're at the end times. And this is these events are going to happen. Okay. Now, isn't that something? He he was a normal guy, and God. Can God shut up the planet's rain because some normal guy prayed? Of course he can. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave a shower, and the earth sprouted her, her fruit. Brothers of mine, when someone among you guys actually is wandering in air from the hidden truth, he's off base, you see that, and someone turns him back, let him know that the one who turns back a sinner out of his wandering error of his road is going to restore his soul out of death. He's on a path that's going to destroy him, and he's going to cover a multitude of sins. Okay, that is, those sins will not be committed. Okay? And again, when he says, take the suffering of Elijah, that's a time of great darkness when the, the Baals, remember Jezebel? She had her own administration. And you know, kings, ancient kings, we have they, they have signet rings, and, and certain powerful men have these signet rings that they use. Okay, we've dug up amazing uh, some of those things. Our archaeologists have. One of, one of the things they dug up was uh, Jeremiah's secretary is Baruch. They've they've got his signet ring. Okay, what a thing to find! And it was a time of darkness, and, and God told Baruch, he said, Jeremiah, go tell Baruch, are you seeking great things? You stop seeking those things. You'll be getting out of this with your soul, and that's the only reward you're going to get. Okay. But they also dug up a signet ring of Jezebel. She's the king's wife. What in the world is she doing with a signet ring? You get the idea? She's got her own cabinet. Her husband is not running the kingdom. She is. And she's killing the prophets and doing mass murder and lying and setting people up, uh, doing those type of things. And, and, um, and that here is Elijah right in the midst of that mess. Speaking on behalf of God. And all of a sudden, he has to flee the nation. Goes up to the Sidonian woman. Goes up there where she's taken care of. And at the end of that, she says, Now I know you're a prophet of God. Uh, you're the real thing. Because God took care of her through, through him. Okay? But it was a time of great darkness. And his time is going to be mirrored, that great darkness, during the time of the tribulation. Job, 1926. I know that my Redeemer lives. And in the last days, I will see him with my own eyes, from my own flesh, because I'm going to stand upon the earth. You see the resurrection? I know that day is coming. And right now, he, his, his posture was, I just want to die. I just want to die. All right. Now, he ends with this by talking about covering sin and turning somebody from their sin. It's going to take us to Philemon. Okay? I like Philemon. His name means friend, Philos, you've heard of philos, which is love or kiss or friendship. Philemon, friendly. You'll like this. This is about restoring a sinning brother. And being very honest about his sin that he's done. Okay. Paul, the insignificant. A bound prisoner of the anointed chosen Christ, Jesus, who restores. And Timothy, who values God, for that is the name of his meeting. The brother. 
To Philemon, the friend, who is genuinely agape of loved and working with us. And to Aphia, the productive one, the sister, Archippus, the horse master. <clears throat> what a name, what a name. Some, some of you, your parents would call you the horsing around master. The fellow soldier with us, and to the called out assembly according to your house, that the church that meets there. <clears throat> Free grace to you guys, and well-being peace from a God who watches. Not the God, but a God who watches. A father for us, a boss Lord, Jesus, who restores who is the anointed chosen Christ. I am well graced with thankfulness to God who watches, who is mine at every time, being one making mention of you personally, because it's just see you is singular, but my well-held prayers, hearing about that which is yours, that a genuine agape concern, and the faith which you have towards the boss Lord Jesus who restores and for all those who are the holy ones. Put a W in front of that. Holy people are people whom God has made them whole. If he's made us whole, we should be living that way. We should be holy because he's holy. So this way, the sharing of the faith, which is yours, may actually become energized by a genuine, intimate knowledge of every good thing, and that which is among us for the anointed, chosen Christ. We're entering into that for his sake. For I have obtained... Much grace, joy, and called alongside comforting strength upon your genuine agape concern because the emotional spleens of the holy people, that is the bowels of compassion or the, the innards of the emotions of God's holy people, have become rested again through you, brother. And by the way, the saints would show up there and they get rest. Okay. My own read on this, I think they're running some kind of a retreat center or something like that where God's people are going up there and, and getting some rest and relaxation. Okay. By the way, if you're following along in your own translations, what I'm doing is I'm taking you back to, to the Greek text and pivoting off of that. Okay. It's a little more rigid, but you can, we can see how we get from there to what, you're, what you have before you. Now, on account of that, having much boldness in the anointed Christ to line you up for that which is proper. Okay. Now, he's getting here. He's going to get to the point. I'm going to be bold, and I'm, I'm going to talk to you about this, about how to handle this situation uh, correctly. Rather, on account of genuine agape concern, I call you to comforting strength. Let me help you here. Being such a one as Paul the insignificant, who is older, but now also a bound prisoner of the anointed Christ Jesus who restores. I'm, I'm calling you to encouraging strength concerning this child who is mine, who I fathered in my prison's bindings, Onesimus the profitable. Now watch the pivot of, uh, of what he's going to do here. Okay, He's profitable, whose former context to you was unprofitable. Okay? But now, for you and for me, he's well profitable. You see the play off, his, off of his name? Okay, I know he's been pretty unprofitable of late. <laughs> he's a, you got a servant who, he's a runaway slave. He meets up with Paul, and Paul is going to talk about it. Maybe he owes you some money, or maybe he stole the pickup. Uh, maybe he stole the chariot and the horses, or what, what he did, we, we're not quite sure. His former context to you, he was pretty unprofitable. Paul acknowledges that he was kind of worthless when he was around. But now for you and for me, he's well profitable because God has changed him. By the way, it's the beauty of, of Christianity is I can look back and say, I'm not what I was. I'm not what I was. Which one I sent back to you in person. This one who is my spleen's emotion, my mouth's of compassion, my, my innards here, okay? Spleen's emotions. Okay? By the way, the spleen is the same word used in Acts 1, Judas hanged himself and evidently it broke and he fell down this, this cliff and it says his, his bowels or his insides splattered out of him. It was a horrible mess. But that's the idea here. And um, there are certain people that we all have in our lives that affect us on the inside. Right? When they make mistakes and, and, and get hurt and they stumble, 
we have mercy towards them. And in the Bible, they even talk about wear those mercies as a garment and treat people kind because people are a mess. We're all a mess. Mm-hmm. By the way, I, I got to tell you, everybody I've ever known looked pretty good until I got to know them. And after, after I got to know them, I thought, you know, you remind me of me. <laughs> You're as much a mess as I am. Uh, I can't think. And uh, my wife's got a, a friend. She says, do you struggle with this? <laughs> she said, I struggle with everything. <laughs> I thought, you know, that's about as well as you can put it. Uh, we're trying to get along in life, and we're sick of bills, and we're sick of life, and we're sick of being sick, and we're all, 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 we're all on that. We're sick of failing. All right. Verse 13. Which I advisedly wanted to hold. He, I wanted to hold him here from, for myself in order that on your behalf he would be my through-the-dust deacon in the bindings of the good message. You'll notice the word deacon is used in the Bible as just regular servants. So it's not a special church term. It's just a normal term for serving. But without your knowledgeable consent, I did not want to do not one thing in order that it would not be as according to forcing your goodness but rather according to your voluntary willingness. So he meets up with Paul in Rome. Paul leads him to the Lord. He said, I, I, I'm my father to him. He actually knows the Lord now. And I'm sure the guy wanted to stay there and, and serve Paul. And Paul is saying, no, you've got to go back and face the music, but I'm going to send a letter with you. This letter goes with Colossians and it goes with Ephesians as they take it back. Okay. And they're going to go over to an area called the Lycus River Valley. And there's all these hot springs over there and these retreat areas where people from around the, the known world in those days would go there. And they would go there to uh, get comfort and to rest and things like that. So he pivots off all of those terms. I think that's what's going on. Verse 15. By the way, it's, it's good of Paul to realize I could take advantage of this as but I better not. You need to go back. Right? so that we're in line with your master's desire here. Verse 15, For on account of this, briefly, he was separated for an hour in order that you might actually have him back forever. It seems to be what God's doing. Not still as a slave, but above a slave. More than that. A genuinely agape concerned brother. He's not only a slave, but he's a fellow brother in Christ, right? For me, but how much more for you? also for you, and the physical flesh. You could actually translate this as also the desires of the flesh. And I know the word flesh usually means something bad, but not always. And also in the boss Lord. He's got a new relationship with me, a new relationship with you, a new relationship with the Lord. Okay? Now, remember James talking about covering the multitude of, of sins. There are times in restoration when a brother comes to Christ and he's got to face the music that there are certainly times for some of us to intervene and help out. Okay? And, and go do this. I remember years ago, it was, I came to know the Lord. I spent a year in San Francisco. And I was down there. And I remember a guy who was at the church there, he got a job in downtown San Francisco. Okay, if you don't know anything about San Francisco, it is a vile and violent city. Okay, it was back then, and now it's totally out of control, totally out of control. But he got a job working in a store, and part of the, his payments was he lived in an apartment uh, uh, upstairs. And there was a friend of mine. His name was Rocky, and I remember him. He, we were chatting. It's been quite some time that he'd been down there, and he said, "You know, he's a mess. Let's go get him." So we hopped in the vehicle and we drove down to where he was. And he was upstairs in his apartment. And Rocky looked, looked at him with almost tears in his eyes. you got to get out of here. This isn't working. It wasn't working. Kind of thing. And I remember him telling him, said, listen, I've gotten myself in debt and I can't get out. I can't get out of here. I work at that store down there and I just get further in debt. And so he said, let's go down there. And they went over to the manager. And he said, how much does he owe you? And he told him exactly what he, that young man owed him. And Rocky pulled the money out of his pocket and paid him on the spot. He said, now get your stuff and uh, let's get out of here. And that's what he did. He went back up to his apartment, he got all of his clothes, etc., and just left. Okay? That's intervention like, like this. Verse 17, if therefore 
you hold me as a fellow partner. He's a business partner. What partnership? Is something uh, is it related to uh, the comforting of the saints? Well, then receive him as me. If he's wronged you or if he owes you something, you reckon this to be mine. Some of us think on my account. You reckon this to be mine. I am the one who owe you, not him. This guy's a slave. He's got no way to give you any money. I will, I will take that, right? If he's wronged you. Now, this is not like a subjunctive form, and he has, or an optative, but he, but he didn't. Paul leaves it in his court, okay? I don't think he's saying he does or doesn't owe you, owe you money because he might. I think Paul is just saying, if you determine that he has taken something from you that needs to be restored, that's my bill. You give that to me. And Paul leaves that to him whether he wants to dismiss the charges or not. Okay? I, Paul, the insignificant, I've written this in my own hand. I, even I, I'm going to pay it back. My guess from this is that the, something has been taken. And Paul says, if you, want, if you want to make an issue of this, and you certainly can. I'm not going to tell you you can or you can't. And when we're intervening with somebody who has uh, gotten in over their head <coughs> and we're going back with them, it's not our place for sure to start take our, our eraser and erase what we think, we think that man owes or doesn't owe. That's not our right. Not that I'm saying to you personally that you also owe me your very self. <laughs> what does he owe Paul? I don't know. We can say, well, maybe the Lord led him to the Lord. He didn't say that. Is it possible that Paul actually financed his, his lodge or his retreat area or something like that because he calls himself a business partner? I don't know what this is. Okay. Verse 20. Yes, brother... I possibly have an advantage of you, with you in the boss Lord. Refresh my emotional insides, my spleen in the anointed Christ. The thing that will refresh me is to make things right with him. Get this thing right. By the way, a runaway slave in the Roman Empire, he can do anything he wants to do with him. Verse 21. Having come to the persuasion by your submissive obedience, I have written to you, Having come to know, because I see it by seeing, knowledge by sight, that you are going to do also the things about which I am speaking. So Paul is pushing this a little bit, and I, I think he realizes he's got some sway. He, he says, I expect to see you honor the Lord somehow in this with, with our new brother. But also at the same time, you personally prepare for me a guest lodging, for I am hoping that through the prayers of you guys, all of you, that I'm going to be grace to you guys. Now Epaphras, Epaphroditus, Epaphras the Lovely, also known as Venus, who is my fellow prisoner in the anointed Christ, Jesus who restores, greets you personally. Philemon. Mark, the war god, king. Okay. Aristarchus, the ruler of the best meal. Demas, the popular. Luke, the light giver. These are my fellow workers. The free grace of the boss, Lord Jesus, who restores the anointed Christ, be with the spirit of you guys. Now notice one spirit among all of, all of them. It could be the, the Holy Spirit. Or it could be the, like the spirit. Uh, the term spirit is not always the Holy Spirit. It can be like the spirit of the age, the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of the Baals, the spirit of a man, the spirit of God, uh, all, all those things. And each church has a flavor or a spirit, an attitude to that church assembly. And it could be literally what he's talking about with that may God grace the spirit of your body there. Uh, or it could be the Holy Spirit, maybe. Maybe. I don't yield towards that myself. But but I'm not quite sure here. Okay. Now, James has ended in the book of James. He, he takes him to the time of struggling and trial. We can pray for each other because that's how God works among us, right? You don't always need uh, the church elders unless it becomes very serious. He says, pray for one another. Um, when it comes to our, our sins and things like that, the few, fewer people that, that are exposed to that, the better. Now, I'm not talking about hiding sin. That, that's evil. We can't do that. But if you're struggling with something, you will notice that Jesus said, buy of me. He said, let me clothe you so the shame of your ungodly life doesn't appear. Let me cover you. The shame of your naked, right? That it is God's desire to clean us up from the inside out. out. And it is God's desire that, that when we're struggling, that we confess that to, to one other 
person. Not another person, maybe your wife, your husband. Okay? It can be an elder or it can be somebody who knows the Lord that you trust and, the, and that um, you find them closed-mouthed and, and safe so that you can meet with them and privately consult with them and tell them what you're struggling with. Okay? And then you can, you can deal with it that way. If all else fails and you're not going to get any victory, that's when you would call the elders. I don't think he's talking about the flu in this passage. He's talking about sin issues, okay? And these things have overwhelmed you and gotten the best of you. And he even uses the word for toil or exhaustion, right? Life is overwhelming. And we, we, you know, we need to all be careful. When you get overwhelmed with life and you get really beaten down and you're struggling emotionally, right? We're all vulnerable at that point in time. Okay? We're all very, very vulnerable. Okay, in the same way that their little boy or little girl, you can see they've been they've been up way too many hours, and they're weepy and they're crying and they have and you see attitudes developing in them and they can't stop them. Right? You start realizing they need to go to sleep. They need some rest. And so you, as a parent, you would intervene in that and say, "I want you to sit down and rest." Right. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down. Okay? Now notice, I don't want to lie down. Well, God's going to make you lie down. Because you're overwhelmed, you're very emotional, and it's a very difficult time. And even, uh, even pastors can do some strange things when they're, a little, they're kind of overwhelmed by it. Okay? There are times we all have that weakness, right? But there are, the, be, be careful. Don't let sin get the best of you. Let me tell you how God sees some of this. Jesus was asked by one of the apostles, how often do I have to forgive my brother? And Jesus said, every time he asks you, you 70 times 7, etc. That's an expression used a couple of times in the Old Testament. Of, you, do, you forgive until I get back. Okay? And if your brother comes to you over and over again and says, I repent, what I did was wrong, over and over again, you forgive him. Now let me tell you something. Why would Jesus say that? Because when you go before God over and over again, and say, God, have mercy on me. What's he going to do? He's going to do exactly what Jesus said he's going to do. He's going to forgive you. And when we come to the Lord, and we're, our lives are a mess, and there's going to be a while before they get this thing cleaned up. And as long as we keep confessing, God keeps cleansing. And eventually, uh, one day, you're going to find, uh, you, your sin is like a big old piece of sin in the back of your pickup, and you're driving down the road, and one day, you'll look back there, and it's all gone, and you don't know where you lost it. And just... It just is gone. And you don't have to go back and look for it. Let the Lord take, take that away from you, and he will do those. Okay? And then also, if somebody does that with you, and you find that they're overwhelmed, and it's a pretty serious thing that they've done, and that um, it, the potential for, uh, for that uh, difficult restoration is there. If you have a position, not everybody does that, but if you have a position where you can intervene in that, then uh, may I suggest that you do. It doesn't have to be me for certain. If you know those people, you see that conflict. I've seen this happen. I've seen it happen right here at Whitestone, where people go, go and try to intercede over a situation uh, and watch good things um, uh, come out of that. Okay? Um, you can do that with issues of sin, issues of finance. Um, you know, Work with them, put them on a budget and things like that. And I say, no, he's, he didn't pay you, and it's been, been six months. And he said he, he would. Um, he's confessed that this is wrong, but he's on this, and he'll do this and begin paying you this much for, uh, for this. Is that agreeable to you? Will you help him do, uh, do this? And give that opportunity to, to run its course. Okay? And if he's got a sin pattern in his past, Onesimus, what was he? Mr. Mr. Useful was what? He's useless, right? He, that's his background. He ain't going to pay. <laughs> Can I think of the idea? If that's his background, th th this may not be fixed overnight. But this is where we can, as, as brothers in Christ, inter interfere, intervene, and get involved if, if we have the relationship with both parties that can make this work. Okay? Now, you know what it's like when somebody says they've repented and they're faking it. Doesn't work. Never will work. Okay, even James chapter 1. If you're a double life, God is not going to answer this, this situation. 
But if you sense that it's, it's a real and you, you can communicate with a brother, I know this is his past, but I, I think God's changed him and is changing him. And what can we do to help clear this up? Okay. And, and, and go that path. Okay. Um, isn't that exactly what Jesus did for you? Went to the Father. He said, Father, there's no way he can pay you back for all the damage he's done and continues to do. It's my bill. Let me pay it. And that's exactly what God the Father has done. Okay? You've got a great friend in our, in our Lord. And God is uh, for bringing all of us to, to peace and bringing all of, everybody calm down. Let's, let's take our sin to the Lord. If it's getting the best of you, uh, or if you see it coming, you see weakness in your life, get some people along there. And uh, I shared this before sometime. I was in seminary, <clears throat> and once a week, uh, all the interns met at one house, and the girls uh, divided over and did devotions together and prayed together, and all the guys did devotions and, and prayed together. And as they took prayer requests, I said, my prayer request this week is, I said, I'm struggling with keeping my eyes off the girls. No girl in particular, just with that. And as I said that, every guy in the circle went, oh, man, me too. Everybody's struggling with that kind of thing. I felt so much better knowing that everybody else is sinking with me. Okay? So we prayed for each other, uh, kind of thing, which is what we should be doing. And these are our struggles. And telling other people, you'd be surprised that you're... Your temptations are common to man. You're just like everybody else, okay? okay? Rule number one in counseling, assume you're normal. So whatever your struggles are, assume they're normal, and assume that your brother also struggles with something, that same thing or something similar, okay? Um, let the Lord change you from the inside out. God is good. He loves you, and He's for you, but He's for you in a different way. He's not for you succeeding on your own merits and on your own uh, grand and glory and glor glor he's for you succeeding to honor his son and to honor him that's what he's after and he's after you glorifying him and enjoying him for uh, forever let God raise you up and let him do great things in you and through you and the great things he's going to do is by telling you calm down <laughs> be a godly man a godly husband a godly father you start there start at home don't do anything great just be faithful uh, mirror the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, same way with the ladies. Be a godly woman, mother, wife. Love your kids. Don't get overly involved in this world. It's easily done. Many good things will destroy great things. Okay, and the great thing is to keep life simple. Do less and do it better. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for the, uh, uh, these words, Lord Jesus. When you were on this earth, James was your half brother, Jacob, and he's uh, he's definitely straightforward in in our face. But thank you for uh, for him and, and the teachings of telling us to take our our trials, take them in stride. They're not all go, all going to go away, and also to, to deal with our sins. That this is the how that you're going to uh, raise us up, and also for Philemon, Lord, and watch us uh, uh, watch him restore a sinning brother who was not a brother and to get involved and uh, not tell Philemon what to do but to uh, encourage him when Paul was willing to take on certain debt himself to make things uh, happen for the better. May we be ha uh, those who have that same spirit and that same willingness. And finally, Lord, for the kids, like young Samuel, there was a time when he did not know you but he came to know you and recognize your voice. May these young kids and teens, may they do the same. In your holy name we pray.